uh, thank you for joining us. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Dr. Joshua Joden. Uh, Josh is coming to us um, from Conan University in Kobe. Um, Josh has spent quite a bit of time teaching, uh, working in education, uh, various places around the world, including Turkey, China, and currently Japan. And his talk tonight will kind of focus on teaching, teaching language, but also teaching how, how we can teach that about sustainable development and trying to tie this in uh, with SDGs. Um, so uh, without giving away, I think his talk will let him tell you the content of his speech. But before that, uh, Cecilia would like to talk to you about uh, GFD. Okay, hi everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, so just a quick notice that we will record this workshop, but it will not show any um, information about the participants. And if you have questions, please feel free to raise your hand. We'll have also a few activities and we'll share the links to those in the chat. So uh, pay attention to the chat and also feel free to just talk whenever you uh, have a question. How do, how do I make this? Yeah, there's no Oh, thank you. Okay, so just quickly talk about GFD to those who have, are not familiar with us. We do, um, we are a faculty development program and we are focused on helping professors to improve their teaching. For This program is focused on professors who teach in other languages than Japanese. And we have a family of programs and activities. Please check our website and also check our LinkedIn. We are there now and you can get updates. We also have a newsletter and upcoming events. Okay. Just click on the screen. Oh, cool. Yeah, so um, at the end of the event, we have a, a form, so a survey and a feedback form. So please check it out. Um, when it shows you an uh, extra screen, don't run away from it. Make sure to click continue to access the form. We'll put it in the chat as well. And for the people in the room, it's there in the handouts. Not that one, the other one. <laughs> yes, that one. And um, there you'll find everything that you need. Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you guys very, very much for joining us this evening. I know tomorrow's a holiday, so I'm sure I really, really appreciate you guys spending the evening with us. Um, so my name is Joshua Joden. Uh, thanks, Jim, for the introduction. I'll be telling you guys a little bit about uh, some of my history and story and whatnot. Uh, we do have a handout, and I think Cecilia is going to send that off in the chat room. Uh, there will be a couple of links, and uh, I'm really hoping that the talk tonight sort of engages everyone online and in person, and uh, we can have a nice discussion towards the end of it. So the name of my talk is The Scope of Sustainability Education in Japanese Universities, uh, Language Education for Sustainable Development. So today I'm going to basically break it down into four different parts. Uh, we're gonna do an introduction where I'm hoping to get uh, the audience to participate a little bit. We're gonna be talking a little bit about uh, why environmental education and science literacy is very important. And I think those people with backgrounds in hard soft sciences are going to have a lot to say about this, especially with what's happened with the pandemic. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to well, take a nice little 10 minute break somewhere in between where we can engage people. And then third part, I will talk about language education for sustainable development or LESD and the scope framework. Uh, the scope framework is something that I hope uh, will be something that you can take today and use it immediately in your classrooms and give you something to start thinking about along those lines. And then we'll have a closing and leave about 20, 30 minutes towards the end for a discussion. Uh, if you do have questions along the way, please feel free to put those in the chat and we will talk about those as we go along. Okay, so let's start by doing a small activity. So I'd like to learn a little bit about the audience and who it is. We are gonna be using an online application that's called Padlet. And you will notice that there is on the Padlet 
once you follow the QR code or the link, um, there is a green button here that you'll be able to, to click. So you'll notice on the handout, it is activity number one, and you can simply just take your, so let me just show you guys here. This is the QR code and the question. So what I'll be asking you guys to do is to, I'll give everybody maybe four or five minutes. And what you do is click on that little plus button that's at the bottom center of the screen, and you will be able to share your earliest memory of nature. So you should be able to see the memory that I've put up there. Please drop your name in there as well. And think back to your earliest experience that was meaningful for you with nature. So that could have been climbing a mountain, seeing the stars, et cetera. So we'll give everybody a couple of minutes just to go ahead and do that. Hopefully everyone's had a chance to do this. Now, part of the reason that we're, we're doing this is I want people to start thinking about their connections with nature. One of the things I'm gonna be talking about today is we live in a world that is a little bit more disconnected from nature in the modern world. So it's kind of fun to see what people's earliest memories are. So here we've got uh, standing in the middle of my grandfather's small vegetable field when I was around five. Um, okay, that's beautiful. By the way, you can go ahead and put little hearts next to by clicking on the heart buttons. And if you'd like to make a comment, something that sparks an interest to you, feel free to comment on other people's ones. Okay, Johnny, I grew up surrounded by nature. So I have early memories where nature does not feature. Uh, climbing the hill close to much of my classes with my cousins, excellent. Running around banana trees, that's really, really interesting. A small river full of fish, so possibly fishing when they were younger. Standing on a beach, experiencing the power of the waves. Swimming and fishing in the lake, reservoir near my grandparents' house, probably around five years old. And then this is mine here, uh, feeding squirrels on top of a mountain in the Canadian Rockies when I was about six years old. Okay, so part of the reason that we are talking about these ideas of nature, obviously, is we wanna ground our concepts and ideas oftentimes with our relationship with nature in our own memories. Um, these obviously are all positive memories, but one of the things that I think a lot of us have experienced and those that are interested in sustainability science, for example, are some of the disruptions in nature. So I've got one more activity I'd like everyone to do to start off. Uh, this one is a little bit different. What we're gonna be doing is doing a Padlet and the Padlet is going to ask you to not only answer the question, but also to give us a place that it happened. And you're, we're going to link those to a giant map. So you'll notice on the handout, there is activity two, which you will see. And for those at home, uh, hang on a second here. I need to have the chat window popping up. For those at home, uh, you can just simply point your phone at the QR code. Now, what I'd like you to do, you'll notice that I've already done this and I've linked mine to Ningbo, China, where I lived. So try to think about a time where nature was disrupted somehow or an, a memory that you've had it could be recent, it could be in the distant past. And I'll give everybody a couple of minutes. Okay, this is great. It looks like we've got ones coming in from the United Kingdom places in China, Japan, Ooh, South America, US, Belarus. Okay, another minute or so, and then we'll have a closer look. Okay, everyone, let's have a quick look. Uh, please feel free to finish up if you're not quite done yet, that's okay. So let's look at the one that comes from Japan first. So we have uh, the 2011 earthquake. Excellent. So this is a natural disaster. This is mine. Uh, air pollution in Ningbo, China. I worked for the University of Nottingham. And uh, that was the first time I ever had to wear a mask. And the pollution was so bad, I had to wear a mask four to five times a week, which was pretty wild. 
I was well prepared for the pandemic. Um, Istanbul, the earthquake in 1999. Excellent. Yeah, my wife is Turkish, so she experienced um, sort of the aftermath of those. Uh, Rosedale, UK, a stream near my house was horrible rust brown and stank of pollution. Okay, so man-made disaster of some kind. Wow, okay. Somebody experienced the Chernobyl reactor exploding. Let's move down to the United, this the United States or Canada. Lake Erie, so polluted beach on Lake Erie. We had special school holiday because of a huge hurricane, right? So another natural disaster. And down here at the very, very end, I think this is, okay. So deforestation from Chile. So one of the things that, and again, grounding a lot of the work that we do in nature is understanding both our love for nature and also our want or need to try and protect it. I'm gonna tell you guys a little bit about my story and sort of how I came to do language education for sustainable development and go through just a little bit of my experiences and how I've seen some of this environmental destruction, particularly the man-made environmental destruction sort of firsthand. Um, so this is a map of Alberta, uh, where I'm from, Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And you'll notice that down at the very, very bottom, the big red arrow, this is where I grew up. So Calgary, Alberta is sort of the center of the oil industry in Canada, sort of the commercial center, I guess you could say. And then up at the very, very top, you'll see a big orange circle. That is where most of the oil sands are located in Canada. You'll hear it in the news quite often now that there's the Ukraine war on, Canada sort of stepping up production to try to um, help out with that endeavor. And many, many years ago, I had the opportunity to work in a small, small community called Fort Mackay which is an Aboriginal community, uh, so a, a Native American community that is just north of Fort McMurray, about 30 minute drive. Now, one of the things that I experienced firsthand was my drive going from where I lived. So I wasn't Aboriginal myself, I'm, I don't have Native ancestry. So I lived in the oil camp, which was run by Syncrude, which is the oil company. And I used to drive through the middle of the, uh, the oil sands every single day. Uh, and this is the kind of trucks that they are driving up there, which is unbelievable. I'm six foot tall. And you can see me standing next to that tire. The tire is almost twice the size as I am. So this is day-to-day -day life up there. Basically the oil sands, what's really, really fascinating is this oil isn't like a lot of other places on earth where you just drill a hole and out comes oil. You actually have to dig it up through the sand and it's a very, very chemically intensive process. And it leads to tailing ponds, uh, which are these massive lake looking ponds. Another big part of it was seeing the types of pollution every single day. So, um, these basically driving between the oil, the camp where I worked, the Syncrude camp, right, where there was, I don't know, I think it was like a thousand different men that were camped out there and women that were working in the oil sands, and then driving to Fort Mackay every day, I would pass through both the tailing ponds, which are a mixture of salts and suspended solids, and chemical compounds like acids, benzene, hydrocarbons, bitumen, and water. And what was really, really fascinating was sorry um no can you reshare reshare the slides oh are they not being shared okay sorry oh, yeah just one moment some people say they can't see them okay can we see the slides maybe just give a, a thumbs up in the chat yes yes okay Excellent. Yeah, okay, so one of, one of the fascinating things is when you're up there is immediately you're hit with this crazy smell in your nostrils and you're also bombarded by a sound and it's small little air cannons that they put all the way around these tailing ponds. And these tailing ponds are not ponds. 
ponds. These are lakes, right, that they've got. And basically it's so that animals don't drink from them, birds don't land in them, because a lot of the environmental groups would have a heyday, <laughs> right? And then this is typically what you'd see. Uh, the, the, on the right is a crane that is digging up and dumping things into those giant trucks that I just showed you. So you can imagine the scale of this huge crane. And then of course, lots of fog and haziness and stuff. Now, the people that I was working with are the people of Fort Mackay. Uh, these are some of the uh, people that I worked with. Uh, this was for a Canada Day celebration that we went to in Fort Mackay, or Fort uh, McMurray. These people, their way of life, right, they are completely surrounded by oil sands now, right? And this dramatically affects their way of life. So it's not only an environmental issue, but it's also the sort of human social issue, right? These are typically nomadic people who used to travel and hunt, and now they are unable to do that because of the oil sands. Now, they had a very, very, very bright chief who started their own oil company so they could take advantage of that and provide their people with the economic benefits that came out of that. Um, but of course, it was quite eye-opening to see, and I learned so much from those people. So that was the first time that I really experienced the oil sands and real destruction. I, I benefited as an Albertan for many, many years. I used to get checks from the government, um, which were called Ralph Bucks. Ralph Klein was the premier of the time, and he used to give out oil money to everybody. So I used to love oil, I guess, until I saw this. Um, the next place, one of the most recent places I lived was uh, Nottingham. I worked at Nottingham Ningbo, China. So the University of Nottingham has three campuses around the world, one in Malaysia, one in China, and one in uh, Nottingham in the UK, of course. And this is the place where I had to wear a mask four to five times a day. So I lived actually in that kind of golden tower on the right-hand side. Um, before I arrived, this whole area, there was nothing there, basically. Three years before, this was all farmland. And when I arrived, there were some buildings and the construction just went. So it was enormous uh, sort of economic push and development. It was really quite astounding, but for us, Obviously, seeing and wearing masks, you know, three or four times a day, this is well before the pandemic was kind of eye-opening. Um, this is the view that we had from our window. And on the right-hand side, you will see a beautiful tower. It looks like something that comes from New York. I think it was fashioned on New York. And it would light up at night. It was really, really quite incredible. I could, you know, if I opened the window, I could throw a tennis ball and hit it kind of thing. Some days I couldn't see it because the pollution was so thick, right, which was, unbelievable to me. And then if you look on the left here, this is our friend Iris. She's looking out over top and you can see the construction, right? We watched Skyrise. We were there for about three years and we watched whole cities be developed over farmland, right? In an instant. So I learned very, very quickly that that economic growth, China pulling billions and billions of people out of poverty, right? Has real consequences. And the people generally were very, very happy about the growth in China. But it was amazing to me to see the pollution, the river pollution, and then also, um, you know, people being sort of pushed off their land suddenly, right? We watched um, wet markets disappear in the middle of the night, for example. So it was quite an experience. Uh, here's another, this is sort of what a typical day would look like. That haziness is the pollution. This isn't a, a trick of photography or anything. Usually the sky would kind of go orange and you knew that that was a day you had to wear a mask. And of course we were checking the AQ. So I've experienced a couple of different things, several other things as well as in Turkey, but um, the last sort of major piece of my puzzle came together when I was a grad student at Kyoto University. Uh, I've been teaching languages for a long, long time, uh, over 15 years now in different universities around the world, in Turkey, in China, and now in Japan. And one of the things I was always really interested in is I would love to integrate sort of sustainable topics into what I was doing in the classroom. And a lot of the textbooks and things had chapters on things like climate change, but these were typically a one-off. First chapter would be climate change, next chapter would be let's visit the airport, the third chapter would be let's go to a cafe. And I was thinking climate change is an inextricably 
complex and dynamic, right? It deals with all sorts of different elements of science. Why are we spending one week on doing this, right? And was language educators, was people teaching English as a second language, were university professors teaching content in English doing enough? So I came to these different questions, right? Why is environmental education and science literacy important and essential to what we do in our day-to-day -day lives? So let's talk a little bit about it. So there's a couple of definitions here that some people in the audience may not be as familiar with. Um, let me talk a little bit about environmental education. Now, environmental education, let me just put up here, refers to the organized efforts to teach how natural environments function, how human beings can manage behavior and ecosystems to live sustainably. Now, when we talk about sustainability, uh, this is one thing I want to sort of emphasize. Um, in 1987, the United Nations Brundtland Commission defined sustain sustainability as something that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So I'm just going to break this down a little bit because I think this goes to the very heart of what we do in environmental education. We need to meet the needs of the present, right? So we need clean water, clean air, all of those types of things. We need energy, we need fuel, and we can't do that through compromising future generations and their needs for those same things. And this goes really to the heart of what we do in environmental education, right? Showing people these ecosystems that we are inextricably linked to. Um, one thing that always sort of surprises me is often how disconnected our students actually are in the real world, right? They put their bags of gomi, their garbage outside and it disappears, right? Nobody knows where that goes. Or you flush the toilet and it disappears, right? We live in sort of this sanitized environment where we really are disconnected. Clean water comes from our taps, for example. And the, the realization that if our students aren't connected with these ecosystems or understand where our garbage, our waste products go, um, then we, we sort of have this real, real issue. So that's sort of the idea of environmental education when you hear me talk about it. And then science literacy, I know we have a lot of um, scientists in the room, so this would be something that's quite familiar, but this is the idea of the written numerical digital literacy to understand science and its methodology, observations, and theories. Now, in my undergrad, I studied philosophy. I was very, very interested in the philosophy of science. And so really trying to understand these processes of science and how science really, really works. Um, before I studied this, I used to think that whatever a scientist said was the truth, we should follow it. But that's not how science actually works, right? Science is a consensus building system, right? We publish in journals and we get criticism and feedback. And if our ideas aren't good, they don't win the day, right? Or a new idea comes along and replaces it. And this is one of these fundamental understandings of the way that we do these that I think is also sort of missing from the world that we have. So I'd like to throw this back at the audience, because I think the audience is going to come up with some pretty interesting ideas. But basically, why do you think environmental education and science literacy is important? For those that are online, feel free to just um, maybe a couple of sentences in the chat window would be great. And uh, for those that are in the audience, if you want, there is a little bit of space. You can scribble down a couple of ideas if you want. And we'll um, share some of those ideas. But, um, feel free. Please introduce yourself and then please tell us what you think. Hey, um, I'm Tito. Um, I like the program. So I'm a chemist. Um, so what I wrote down here was we need to understand our environment in order to interact with it properly. Our environment is built on science. So um, yeah, we need science to understand uh, that's important. 
But of course, you don't have to be a scientist uh, to be scientifically literate. Uh, so it is again on different levels. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Do you want to? Yeah, sure. It would be great. Okay. Thank you, everybody in the chat. We're going to read out a couple of those comments, get you guys to participate as well. Thanks, Tito. Okay. So there's one comment from Mahar. Improper knowledge helps to hopefully be politicized discussions around environmental issues. Okay, so proper discussion. Yes. Then the second comment is because recently we have realized that raising awareness and taking action by using the knowledge in these areas are best bet to survive and lead a livable world to the next generation. Excellent. Thank you. And oh, got one. one more. Okay, yeah, please. Okay. One from Johnny says, I am definitely in the same camp as Joshua on these. I think that, that the public needs to understand what science is and what it isn't, what questions it can appropriately address and what questions it cannot. In particular, I think understanding the difference between science and the work of scientists is key. Science is often misunderstood and see only as a particular kind of authority to be followed. Particularly, there is a common habit in the media to present two sides of an argument as equal in a debate. But understanding science shows that sometimes this balancing of perspective is not happening. Excellent. Yeah, thank you very much, John. And we got one other audience member. Hi, how are you? Do you want to share? Sure. Please sure. do. Yeah, please tell us your name too. Thank you for coming. Hi, so uh, my name is Pavel, and uh, I'm pleased to like Australian, actually, so I'm a science believer. <laughs> <It's like, yeah. laughs> Let's coin that. I think that's a good one. Yeah, it's the kind of the question is why is the environment education science is that these are actually important. So, science literacy uh, is important because I really believe the science uh, are very. Uh, that was real or two because that is more well to understand the world of living. So, and so uh, it can actually protect us and uh, help us understand the world of living. So, that is the uh, way to navigate uh, the world and probably related to the environment education. We want to be talking about our environment in some, let's say, good way. Awesome. Thank you very much, Pavel, sharing. Okay, that's wonderful. Thank you very, very much, everybody. Do, Jim, do you, you got something you want to share as well? No, you're good? Okay, okay go. All right, thank you. Um, so we got lots of really fantastic ideas, right? To understand the environment and how it's linked to our everyday lives, right? Um, echoing what Tito was saying, uh, creating the proper discussions, as Masaki said, Johnny said a lot of really, really great things that sort of resonated with me, particularly the idea of that two sides to an argument debate, right? Often in science, we deal with consensus. And if we've got 100 people in a room, 99 of them agree to something, that's probably a good way to go. But our media typically takes the one person who doesn't and one person from that 99 and puts them together right, on a TV show to debate the science. So we lose track of a lot of those things. And then like Pavel said, this idea of a powerful tool, right, to protect us. Um, so ways that we can understand the world. I'm going to talk about sort of three major challenges I sort of have thought quite a lot about in terms of that we need to do as educators, right, um, and some of the biggest challenges for us. And hopefully this is a, an area as well, uh, if you agree or disagree, we can maybe have more of a discussion about it a little bit later. So the one major area that I think is struggling a little bit is this idea of politics. So let me explain a little bit what I mean by that. Um, many of the scientists in the room will probably recognize this chart, right? We see this quite often when it comes to Climate change, right? It's showing since 1880, 
the global surface temperature departing from average. And when we talk about this, right, um, a lot of people, and I've had to explain this to a lot of people in my family and friends that, that maybe aren't as science literate, but they tend to think that 0.5 or 0.1 is not a big deal, right? The, the temperature outside is 14 degrees. If it's 15, what does it matter? Or if it's 16, what does it matter? And I oftentimes hear people talk about that, but I try to always use the analogy of a body, right? And I think everyone's familiar with body temperature now that we've all gone through COVID, right? Uh, if you are 38 degrees, not 37, which is where you're supposed to be, you're in big trouble, right? And it goes the opposite direction as well. And currently the CO, the COPE 27, uh, 27, is that right? Just the 27 just ended. And I know a little bit lukewarm. There's a lot of people out there that aren't very happy, but they're pushing for 1.5. They're pushing for two now, a lot of countries, right? Saying that we can't keep it to that 1.5. That's not a realistic goal anymore, which is a little bit troublesome. So this whole idea, right, is sort of a stark reality. And we get to it from many, many different areas. So 1880 to 2021. This is the number of prime ministers we've had in Japan from 1885 to 2022. And the total is 102 prime ministers in almost the same time frame. On average, that means if we look over that, that each prime minister has less than two years to do anything. And this is really where I think that we need a public that is aware of these science issues, right? To push these agendas, to make politicians start thinking a little bit more longer term. Um, for those that are wondering, Shinzo Abe is the longest serving prime minister. He served eight years and 267 days, but that was over two separate times. I think the first time he was in office for about two years, and then the second time was just over six years. So he possibly had enough time to put something forward and start thinking a little bit more longer term. But again, the average is less than two years, right? So this is kind of not great. We're sitting in a burning house and people are saying, mm, everything's fine, right? This is not the case. So in terms of that politics, that first idea, right? I'm gonna throw a question out there and hopefully this will provoke a bit of a, a discussion later. How can we expect reasonable changes in long-term environmental issues? So like climate change, right? Which is something that we've been experiencing now for the past hundred years or so. Um, if our elected officials have such a short term in office, right? The short term thinking, as soon as they get elected, they're already thinking about their longevity, right? Two years is nothing with most politicians. The second thing I want to talk about is a little bit about our science education. Um, in general, this is something that I've always sort of been blown away by, is we don't always have a basic understanding of uh, statistics, basic understanding of probability. And one of the, the things that always surprises me, and this happens in every single country, is the lottery, right? Um, if you play the lottery, don't feel bad, right? There's still an exciting, as long as you know the probabilities going into it, right? But the probability, for example, of winning the lotto six. So the lotto six means that there's 49 balls that are gonna be drawn. You have to get six of those numbers, those balls drawn in order exactly correct, right? The probability of that happening is one in almost 14 million chance of winning, right? But the allure of getting this big cash payout is very, very exciting. Just to put that in perspective, 14 million chance of winning, you have a one in million chance of getting hit by lightning in your lifetime, which is ridiculously small. So this is, four, you gotta get hit with lightning 14 times in your lifetime to win the lottery, right? Now, the lottery does a lot of really, really excellent things in Japan. So. Eight, uh, 813 billion yen from 2021. And about 40% of that was paid to prefectures, right? So it helps us build our cities. Um, about one and a half percent goes to social contributions, public relations, and the rest is kept. So there is good things to this, but of course 
this is still, um, you know, it shows you how much money is dumped into things like lottery and without an understanding, right? It's like casinos back in Canada, the house always wins. It's not a good way, right? If you're going to take 500 bucks in, you're probably going to lose it. The other one that I want to talk a little bit about, right, is our COVID pandemic. There was so much misinformation, misunderstanding about it. Um, Yamaguchi Shinichi, who's an associate professor in the International University of Japan, um, and he studies misinformation on social media, he saw a huge boom on Japanese Twitter in April and July of 2021. And people, basically this big eightfold increase in misinformation campaigns, right? The vaccines are filled with microchips and Bill Gates wants to take over the world and all these types of understandings. But science works generally, we have a good understanding of how this works and science isn't going to give us those instant answers, right? Which is what a lot of people in the public wanted immediately. And so the science education part of this for me was kind of a big disappointment. And this was one of those apparent recent cases where I was just really disappointed with the chat online. And going back to um, what we talked about earlier, but you know, putting on a COVID denier with a COVID scientist on a news channel and a one-to-one -one discussion when 99% of the scientists out there were on one side and 1% is on the other. Right? It's not a fair discussion, and it leads to so much misunderstanding in the way that the world works. The last little part that I want to talk about is, uh, this is a comic by uh, Wiley Miller, um, and it is called, sorry, Non Sequitur. Maybe you guys have seen this before, but this is one of my favorites. One of the ideas that I'll be talking about a little bit later when it comes to language education for sustainable development is this idea that as scientists, as educators, as people in universities, we really need to embrace complexity. Our world is complex, right? In the past, if you go back 50 years ago, when you got an ear infection, you went to one doctor. And that doctor was a generalist. He knew a little bit about ears, a little bit about eyes, a little bit about throat, lungs, feet. And he basically could diagnose you. But we know so much more now about ears, eyes, basic biology. So we need specialists. Right? And that means that we are living longer lives. So that complexity is something that is powerful right? and has really, really benefited all of us. So a little question to get us thinking a little bit about this. How can we expect forward thinking policy on major issues like COVID or climate change if our voting public does not trust scientists, right? has a hard time differentiating between facts and fiction, right? where to get good information, and then also where simple answers, right? Bill Gates and microchips is easier to understand, right? right? The big rich guy is trying to control us than actually understanding what a vaccine does in our bodies, right? And how it works and how it can protect us and our family and other people around us. The last one that I wanna talk about today, and then I think we'll uh, have time for a quick break, 10 minute break, uh, is this idea of a siloed fields of education, right? One of the things that happens quite often in universities uh, is we have different faculties. We have a science faculty, right? And a social science faculty. And oftentimes they don't necessarily talk to each other, right? They speak oftentimes different languages. And there's a lot of good reasons for why they do, right? But I think we do need to start looking elsewhere and looking at those changes in the world. So one, one area that I just want to talk about, let me use an analogy of a racehorse here, is uh, the field of language education, which I'm very, very familiar with. Language education has come a long way in the last 50 to 100 years, right? We started off with root memorization, right? If you want to learn a language, it was just a list of words and you memorize them and you went in. We had audiolingual ones where you listen and write, or you write while you're listening, right? And that was a way to learn. These days we have very, very good communicative methods of teaching languages. We have very, very powerful ways to teach vocabulary um, and understand them. And so at the end of the day, right, us educators are writing this amazing thing in our fields, rushing towards language proficiency. 
And if you're a good teacher and you're doing those things in our field, you're going to get to that language proficiency much better than you would in the past. The other one I wanna talk about just is environmental education. This is another field where we've come a long, long way in the last 40 or 50 years. And again, it's the same sort of idea. At the end of the day, this racehorse is running towards what we call pro-environmental behavior change. Now, when I say pro-environmental behavior change, what I mean is in people's lives, generally we want people to make decisions. We want people to vote, right, for good policies. We want people to recycle. We want people to do all of these types of things. And we have environmental educational uh, lists have come up with some amazing ways to do that and to get there. So again, if you riding this horse as a teacher and educator, you will you know, eventually get to this end point. But one of the things that we're doing, does anybody know what this is? Those people in the audience, feel free to peg in as well. There's a little mask over the horse's eyes. This is the red dot there. These are called blinders or blinkers. And they have sort of four purposes in racehorsing, right? Uh, it's to focus the animal, it's to shield its vision, right? So it's only looking sort of down straight towards the goal. Uh, it makes it go straight, right, on the race course and it reduces the horse's stress. They're very jumpy creatures. In that same way, right? I sort of feel like these siloed areas of education <clears throat> If I talk about language education, for example, the world has changed, right? Climate change is a reality. And we are doing very, very little to sort of integrate this new reality in with our students. So we are sort of teaching things. We are, sometimes we teach one lesson in climate change, but again, climate change is unbelievably complex and you can't just do it in one lesson, right? It's not giving it what it needs and it's not challenging students' beliefs and values around this. So I challenge the language education field in that way. And in terms of environmental education, environmental education used to be quite place-based, right? If you were a Japanese student and you were doing some sort of an environmental education activity, you were learning about the environment in Japan. Right, and reconnecting to that environment, but you didn't know about what was happening in Brazil, right, necessarily. And so we need a new language, right? We need to expand what we do in environmental education field, because as we all know, right, when the forest is getting chopped down, the rainforest in Brazil, this is affecting us here in Japan, right? And what we are shipping overseas in terms of garbage is affecting people in other countries. So we need people that can communicate these ideas much, much more broadly. So again, I'm gonna leave everybody with just a quick question to start thinking about. How can we expect to deal with these existential threats like climate change or deal with emerging opportunities in this more integrated world, right? This world that is more interconnected than ever. If our fields do not embrace interdisciplinary, intercultural approaches, things that are much more broad in that sense. So as I see it, sort of three major challenges, the politics, our science education, and these siloed fields of education. I I'd love to hear if people agree or disagree with me. And so uh, after the break, I'm gonna be talking more about language education for sustainable development and how it can help us to deal with these three major issues. So with that, we'll take a quick 10 minute break. Uh, thank you to everybody online and in person. We'll see you guys after the 10 minutes. So what is language education for sustainable development? Um, for those that are interested in the language teaching end of things, you might be familiar with uh, EFL, English as a foreign language, um, EAP, which is English for academic purposes, or CLIL, content and language integrated learning. If you're a content teacher or a subject teacher, these might be a little bit less familiar to you, but it's more than likely that you are using some of the elements of this when you're teaching, especially if you're teaching Japanese students and they're in English, or you're asking them to do um, grant applications or essays, scientific reports in English, type of thing. 
And then it's looking at sustainability education. And we can break this down into a couple of different areas. So there's ESD, which is probably one of the most familiar ones. Um, this has been around for a while now, and I'll talk more about this because it's very important. Environmental literacy, uh, sustainable development, which you probably are familiar with, with the sustainable development goals, and then environmental education, which I talked a little bit about earlier. So the idea here is I really started learning quite a lot in my PhD in particular about sustainability education, and I realized quite quickly that a lot of the concepts are the same. Uh, they're just using different language. So what we say in language education, what we say in sustainability education for something like critical thinking, and in sustainability education, we used to talk about values, beliefs, and norms. Essentially, this is the same idea, right? So a little bit about ESD education in Japan, just for those that may be unfamiliar. Uh, Japan had an action plan called the Decade of Education for Sustainable Development. Uh, this was something that was from 2005 to 2014. And the idea was they wanted to create the sustainable society. So MEXT, which is a organization here in Japan that promotes uh, educational types of things, they were really, really pushing this idea of education for sustainable development. And this is an idea that's been around for quite a while. Uh, I think it was sort of been around since it was basically, there was environmental education and then this was jumped off of it once they started defining what sustainable development was. And there's really three elements to sustainable development. Uh, many of you probably know this, but the idea of the environment, right? The economy and the society, and the idea that those things are in balance. Recently, Japan is also pushing things. You'll, you'll start seeing SDGs everywhere here in Japan. Uh, for those that are coming in from Canada, hi, Dad. Uh, you, uh, you probably don't see the SDGs as much, but we see these all the time on uh, trains, the Hankyu train in Kansai, where I'm from. They have a whole train dedicated to the SDGs, and each cart is a separate one. For example, Expo 2025, they're doing a huge thing. There's a big push for Society 5.0, which integrates all of these SDGs. So ESD is a really, really important idea and concept that's built into this. And then CLIL, again, for those that are basically what CLIL is, is according to Machisto and Marsh and Frigolas, um, a dual focused educational approach in which an additional language is used for the learning and teaching of both content and language. So again, if you're teaching, for example, a chemistry class in English to your students and getting them to do lab reports, CLIL is probably going to be an element of that. Some additional parts of CLIL, um, there's the communicative part, right? Being able to speak and express ideas, be able to write and express ideas, uh, and then also be able to bring in your culture and your context, right? So here for us in Japan, for those uh, people in Canada, et cetera. So the idea here is there's two general goals. First goal is providing tools for our students to communicate their ideas broadly. Now, this is where the language part comes into play, right? Again, like I mentioned earlier, we have this very, very good discipline where we have these great techniques nowadays. And if you want students to improve their language proficiency, um, we have a lot of really great ways to do that. And language education generally can do those types of things. We want students to communicate broadly. So be able to write, be able to speak, and not only just write and speak, but we want students to be able to bring ideas from Japan, cultural ideas, um, environmental ideas, inventions, and go to other countries and be able to communicate those to people in common languages. Um, of course, one of the lingua francas is English at the moment. It's sort of the language of science at the moment. Um, I don't know if that's another lecture to get into all those details. I wouldn't want to do that. But uh, it is useful. English is one of those places. But this can be used, LESD can be used for any language. So if you are teaching French, which is another official language of the UN, for example, this is very, very useful. And then having students, uh, like I, sorry, I didn't finish that thought from before, but going into another country and communicating ideas from Japan, and then being able to receive ideas from other countries, other cultures, and bring them back to Japan, right? And then the second goal, of course, is this facilitating understanding of complexity and interrelatedness of challenging global issues for our students. Now, when I talk about this, uh, I wanna emphasize a couple of things. I wanna emphasize this idea of complexity. 
as teachers, um, and I know this was something that I had to get my head wrapped around quite a lot, but we love to simplify things for our students, right? Break it down for them, walk them through processes. And one of the big elements of LESD is actually to embrace this complexity, right? The world is a complex place, right? Uh, climate change takes all sorts of different disciplines to understand, right? And all of those disciplines are coming to the same conclusion, which is the environment is, uh, or the temperature on earth is increasing year after year, right? And we have to embrace this complexity and this interrelatedness of ideas to really solve these global issues and challenges. So let me take you guys through one example and talk a little bit about how this is thought about through um, sort of ESD lens. So let's talk about food waste. Uh, food waste is an enormous problem in Japan. Six million tons of food in 2018 that could have been eaten were wasted. So this is good food. Um, six million tons. Just to give you, uh, put that in perspective, an African elephant, a small male, is about two tons. So that's like throwing away three million tons of African element, elephants, small African elephants elephants. It is an enormous, enormous, enormous problem. Um, it sounds like it is going bigger. Uh, and this is something that's happening all over the world. It's not just a problem in Japan, but our students, our Japanese students, this is definitely an issue. Now, there is a lot of work that's been done in the background here, understanding how, what happens between our ears right, when we start thinking about environmental issues. So let me just explain this. This is something that's called the values, beliefs, and norms model. Of course, we are still newish in neurobiology, right? We don't understand how all of those things connect in the brain. We still don't understand even how language works in the brain, but we have these models that are very effective to understand. So this is one model to understand environmental behavior. Now, when your students, uh, a lot of you are educators, that first day of classes, all of your students have something we call a new ecological paradigm. They are sitting there with a mindset about the biosphere, so the environment around them, right? They have an idea of ego themselves in that environment, right? And they also have this idea of the altruistic, what they should do about the environment, right? And that, those three elements combined are a new ecological paradigm. So just to give you an idea, one student might think that um, trees are boring. He might want a new Lamborghini and he's not really excited about helping other people, right? He's trying to just fill up his bank account, for example, right? That's one kind of student. And another student might really like hiking and going outside, has a respect for the environment, wants to do something about it, um, and feels that they're sort of connected with these ideas, right, for whatever reason. So this is where we sort of start in the classroom. Now, at the end of the day, like I mentioned before, we want to get to this pro-environmental behavior thing. So at some future time, we don't want to, um, let me say this carefully, because this is quite important. The goal of our courses should never, ever be behavior change, right? We don't want to assess students on behavior change. But what we want at some future time, right, when they leave us from our university experience, we want them to do things that are in line with their values, beliefs, and norms about the world, right? And if they understand their connection to the environment, then their behaviors are going to reflect that. Now, this big empty space in the middle is what we have to do in our classrooms, right? This is the challenge here. And this is a hierarchy. So for example, there is the first step. If you think about it like a step, they have to hit the first step before they can take the second step. They have to start being aware of the consequences of these things. So if we talk about the example I gave before, food waste, right? They have to understand uh, the consequences of food waste, right? If we waste food, where do we put that food? Do we throw it in the garbage? Do we put it in the ground? Do we throw it in the ocean, right? We have to understand those consequences. We also have to understand too, uh, you know, issues around like uh, people who don't have enough food, right? Can we use that food to feed them? And then we also have to understand too that, that if we go back to where that food came from, the farmers that put it together, all of that energy, right? That carbon, that intensive farming process to produce that food, and if it's wasted, 
right? We are being inefficient with our resources. So the first step is really challenging students and trying to understand this awareness. The next step the, after they graduate from that is an description of responsibility. So who is responsible for this? Well, am I responsible for six million tons of food waste? Well, not really, but I can make a difference in the choices that I make on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Is it government policy? In fact, it is a little bit of government policy. Um, I had a student who studied this. She worked at a bakery in Osaka. And at the end of the day, they threw out a ton of bread. And that is partly because there is laws in place where you can't sell stale bread in Japan, right? And so policies are a big part of this, right? Government policies, government ideas. And then we can also talk about who else is responsible in this case. The final step is this personal norming step where we actually start saying things like, I want to waste less food. Now, human brain is quite interesting in the fact that we will say things like that uh, and then not do anything about it, right? This is part of the reason that survey data is oftentimes not very useful, right? Social scientists have a hard time with it because people will say, yes, I protect the environment. Yes, I do this. Yes, I do that. And then you find out in reality, they don't. So the next step is this personal norming stage, which is a good place to be, but we eventually want them to actually do that, right? We want to encourage them not to waste food. We want them to uh, talk to their parents and educate others and show other people about it. So this idea, this values, beliefs, norm model in language education speak, this is essentially doing critical thinking, right? A deep dive into concepts and ideas and really exploring them from many, many places. And if you're like me, your teacher brain is working already, trying to think of how would I teach awareness of consequences? What kind of a class would that look like, right? And if you're like me, this is not one class that you can do this kind of thing, right? This is several different types of lessons. This is building and uh, implementing lots of different ways, tasks to be able to get through this. So we have this big group of students and what we want through this language education for sustainable development, we want two things. We want to challenge these values, beliefs, and norms about the environment around them, right? About these major problems and issues that they're challenged with. And we want them to be proficient language users. We want them to be able to express these ideas clearly, right? Written form, spoken form, bring in ideas from their culture, share it with other people, right? This is really the way that we change the world around us. So I won't spend too much time on this, but in general, uh, there is a couple of models that I've come up with. You'll notice that this is that VBN model I talked about on the right-hand side. And then on the left is sort of a newish model of language education where the language content is informed by the sustainable development goals, which I'll talk about in a minute. We have language education discipline, which does an extremely good job. Like I talked about earlier, it is like a racehorse, right? And if you use those techniques, you will get to language proficiency. And then it's that education for sustainable development, the green part in the middle of the VBN model, right? Challenging those values, beliefs, and norms, challenging or, uh, or uh, using critical thinking in the classroom to sort of get students to think about that. And then again, at some future time, we never want this to be the goal of the class. We want them to change their environmental behaviors, right? So the sustainable development goals, as many of you know, um, are a blueprint for us. These were developed by the United Nations. Um, they followed the millennial goals, which uh, was linked earlier to the slides on ESD. And basically what this was is it's still a little bit controversial. <laughs> a lot of people are unhappy with these 17 goals um, for a lot of different reasons, but they are quite good. And one of the things that a lot of criticism comes out of is that the goals are sort of separate. But if you're like me, you, you know that these goals aren't necessarily separate, right? Uh, something like good health is connected to having clean water and sanitation, for example. Right? Good health is connected to having quality education, right? Understanding how to take care of yourself, make those choices. So this new generation, our students, they're faced with pandemic, climate change, 
right? This horrible war with Russia. And here we have a model, some elements that we can focus on, right? That some of the world leaders through the United Nations have decided are areas that we need to spend time on doing. So we're gonna skip this activity. One of the things I wanna emphasize here is this idea of the sustainable development goals being interconnected, right? Um, I know a lot of language teachers uh, and even content teachers who are looking at, for example, trying to isolate just one and look at it. But in fact, these are all interconnected, right? And are major, major issues that we want to solve in the world around us. So how do we go about doing this? I developed something that I call the scope framework. So let me just go through scope being S-C-O-P-E, and it stands for things. Um, those with the handout, you can take a look at the slide up in the top right if you're having a hard time seeing what's on there. So the first one is creating student-centered activities. And when I say student-centered activities, oftentimes uh, us teachers, we often have things that are quite top-down, right? It's teacher-centric. We are teaching, giving information, the students are absorbing. But in this case, we need to create situations where the students can be, uh, we become facilitators in a way, and the students are actually the ones that are exploring these issues in depth. Critical thinking or challenging values, beliefs, and norms. Uh, this is a major, major element that we need to integrate better in our classrooms, finding ways that we can really challenge what students believe about the world. Feedback is a major, major part. There is a lot of research that finding opportunities for self-feedback, peer feedback, and teacher feedback are really good ways to understand the world around us, especially challenging ideas, right? If you have a misconception about COVID, for example, right? Having students being challenged, right? Offering feedback themselves, getting feedback from their partners, their friends, and then the teacher, it can help to understand how these things work better. Uh, practice and demonstrate knowledge. A really good way is to empower our students to actually present, right? Show their knowledge off in important ways. And this can be done through poster presentations, PowerPoint presentations, can be done through uh, conversations that we have in class. And the final last one, and this one I think is really, really essential for a deep dive into language education for sustainable development, is this idea to educate others. So to go beyond your classroom somehow. So let me just talk a little bit about how each of these look and give a couple of examples. Um, feel free for those in the audience, if you have questions, please let me know. So in terms of the student center, um, one of the courses that I teach is a environmental ethics class. And I get the students early on to choose a topic on their own, something that they are curious about. And I try not to direct them in any sort of way. I sort of tell them a little bit about what students have done in the past. And, you know, the students come in and they say, well, what happens when I flush the toilet? Where does that go, right? That's a great research question, right? And it leads the students down all sorts of interesting paths. Um, this student here on the poster asked, where does meat come from, <laughs> right? So she really likes uh, eating meat with her family but she always just goes and picks it up at the butcher and it's already cut nicely for her and, you know. So learning about all of those different elements, right? Um, from the animal to the nutrition for the animal to where it kind of comes from. And then uh, the students presenting on it in groups, right? Being able to express themselves in larger situations. And it's very, very empowering for students if you put them in the driver's seat. Critical thinking, so challenging values, beliefs, and norms. Oftentimes what we do in the classroom is we give a lecture for 85 minutes or 80 minutes in a 90 minute lecture. And we say the last 10 minutes, okay, talk to your partner about what I said, right? That's not critical thinking if we really wanna do it right, right? What we really need to do is engage students where they are, right? Have them bring in their own ideas into it. And then also think about ways that we can challenge, you know, make them aware of consequences of some of these issues. Who's responsible 
and have them write down ideas, right? What they want to do in the world to change these problems or solve these problems in themselves. Offering feedback. There are so many different ways to do feedback and feedback is extremely important. At a university, oftentimes that usually means the student hands in an essay and we give them a mark and we give them a comment and we give it back to them, right? But there is many ways that we can build in, for example, a peer feedback, right? Or before they hand in an essay, you give them a checklist of things that students have to look for and a peer checks. And that's a powerful way for students to learn, right? Because they are looking at somebody else. They have instructions on how to do a lab report. And now they're looking at so another student's lab report and finding mistakes, right? Oh, the student missed this, or they didn't do this correctly. And then also, of course, having um, deeper teacher feedback. And I know that's challenging with our time constraints, but there's lots of ways to do it online. We can use small surveys, et cetera. Um, practice demonstrate knowledge. Again, one of the things I'm trying to develop, I'm currently in the process of writing a book about language education for sustainable development. It's coming along slowly. <laughs> But I've dedicated a lot of time and effort to thinking about this feedback process where, you know, if, if there is students that have ideas about the world around them, we want students to gain this information, this knowledge, right? Go out and research it. And then we want to put them in a situation where they get questions from their peers, right? They get some pushback. They get asked, where did you find this information? And it gives them a chance to rethink these ideas, right? Go and do further research. Oftentimes we end up stopping at that one presentation and then that's it, right? So giving students an opportunity to get feedback and then do it the same presentation with a deeper dive, right? And again, teacher feedback can help to shape those types of things. And then the last part is educating others. Um, one of the things that we do at Conan University, which is really, really wonderful, is we have something that we call Pecha Kucha Nights. And I think Pecha Kucha originated in Tokyo. Uh, and so there's a ton of Pecha Kucha Nights around. Basically what it is, is it's 20 slides, 20 seconds each. And these are great places for students to try out ideas, right? It's a very, very, very good crowd. People are very, very supportive. And if you've got a student that has a great presentation, a great, um, report, give them an opportunity to present it wider because they're going to get more feedback, right? They're going to share this idea with others. And it's a way for them to present their knowledge and understanding about these issues in deeper ways, right? And that feedback process continues. So this is something that I think is really, really, really useful. This could even be as simple as presenting to another class. If you've got another teacher teaching something similar, get your classes to present to each other and do some sort of an online feedback form, for instance. Okay, because I wanna leave a little bit of time for discussion, let me uh, start wrapping things up a little bit. So I talked a little bit about language education for sustainable development and the sort of two goals, right? The one is having students that can communicate broadly, right? Uh, so written, they can communicate their cultural ideas, their spoken ideas. And then also they have a deeper understanding of these critical issues, these complex interrelated issues, um, oftentimes being taught by through the sustainable development goals, which are a really rich source of content. And including elements or rethinking your courses by adding in at least one or two of these elements makes a huge difference. And it doesn't take that much, off, uh, that much effort to try to include these things. Um, us university instructors also have opportunities to develop courses or do the same course again. And oftentimes we can tweak it using some of these best practice uh, and fundamentals of LESD where we can really, really try to improve that critical thinking element that is part of our courses. So our students are facing a world that is very, very different from the world that we faced and our parents faced, right? Recently, we had this pandemic, which was an enormous challenge for everyone. We have world hunger, right? We, uh, this past week, we just hit 8 billion people on the face of the planet. 
And you know, countries like India are catching up to China, are gonna overtake them in the next four or five years at 2.1 billion people. China has 2.2 billion mouths to feed on top of all the people in Southeast Asia. So we have to think about careful ways to use our resources and our students are going to be caught in the middle of that. We're starting to see that right now with heating bills increasing because of things that are happening on the other side of the world, for example. Uh, we live in this more interconnected world. We are fundamentally yeah, interconnected now, right? We are, our worlds are so entangled with each other. What happens here, the pollution from China doesn't stay in China, right? It drifts around the world. And then of course, uh, global climate change. So this idea is we want students to be able to communicate and talk broadly, share their culture ideas, and we want them to have a fundamental understanding of these things, right? Again, it's that complexity, that interconnectedness that is so essential, right? If we want students to change their behaviors in the future. So getting back to that racehorse that I talked about earlier, um, all of us are in these wonderful places that are universities, these uh, places of learning. And we really, really need to start looking around a little bit carefully and rethinking the way that we're doing our courses, right? Uh, looking at communicative ways so our students can share broadly and also meet these enormous challenges like something like climate change. I mentioned earlier, I talked a little bit about this, this idea of our politics, our science education, our siloed fields of education. I hope it is clearer now that something like language education for sustainable development um, and the scope framework can start to hammer away at these challenges, can solve them. But the idea is, is that each one of us as educators becomes sort of a node in a network. And in my classroom, for example, if a student is starting to make these connections between sustainable development, between um, different SDGs, and then they go into your classroom, you have a chance to tie in your own elements, right? And start linking in ideas. Climate change, for example, is very, very complex. So if somebody's learning about chemistry, they can learn about the chemistry of climate change. Somebody's learning about atmosphere, they can start making those connections to atmosphere. And the more of us that are doing this kind of work, having students communicate broadly, right? Teaching them how to present their ideas and then also linking them in with these important things, we really are going to solve some of those major challenges, right? If we have an educated group of people, have and understand these things and can speak out broadly about them, it will change our politics, right? It will change our education. Um, and it will certainly help to change our siloed education system. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank you all very, very, very much. Oops. And uh, thank you very, very much for listening. I'm hoping that we can enter into a bit of a discussion. On the board, you'll notice there is a feedback questionnaire. Um, it would be wonderful if everyone could do that feedback questionnaire. It should only take about five minutes. Uh, there is a link to it on the worksheet down at the very, very bottom. You'll notice on the back side with all of the useful links and references. Uh, and this will do a lot to help uh, create these uh, lectures and make them better in the future and also help me to make these lectures a little bit better. Uh, just to let everybody know a little bit about the worksheet itself. There is some useful references and links on the back uh, if you are interested to some of the things that I referred to here. Uh, and I've also got a, sort of a set of discussion questions that maybe we can help to spark off a little bit of a discussion and stuff. So uh, for those people at home, if you do have questions, feel free to put them down in the chat and we will uh, start a bit of a discussion. Just a quick thing, I just wanna say thank you to Cecilia for all of her work and uh, all of her team. Uh, this has been a really, really wonderful opportunity and thank you for putting all of this kind of stuff on. So huge thanks everyone.
So if uh, you do have any questions or comments, feel free to jump in. I, I think we can get people to actually say them out loud, right? If those yeah, people yeah. are on, online. Hello, can I ask my question? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Um, this is Noran, and I have um, eight years of teaching experience as a university instructor. Currently, I'm not teaching, just doing my MA, and it is going to be about SDG and ELT. Uh, so I'm also trying, I'm interested in, in SDGs and how to integrate them. Um, one um, issue I think I have seen in the papers when I was doing my lit review is how it's going to be feasible to implement SDGs at lower level um, English classes. So I know um, there are lots of studies. I, there were some, you know, example activities that was that were proposed, but they were mostly targeting at higher level proficiency level students. So what what can you suggest for for lower level students? Okay. Thank you very, very much for your question, Nora. Uh, this is a question I get a lot, actually, and it's oftentimes the, the first question that sort of comes out. Um, in, in general, for the lower level students, this is something, um, you know, a lot of the stuff that I showed, right, and a lot of that challenging values, beliefs, and norms is going to be quite challenging, you're right, with students that don't have that language ability. One of the things that is really, really good and a field of education that does a lot of really, really good work around these um, without necessarily having too much of the language is looking at some of the stuff around environmental education itself, uh, place-based education, those types of things. But if you want to bring this into, let's say a first year university class with very, very low proficiency students, there is some smaller areas where you can start. Um, you know, climate change is very, very complex. Maybe climate change wouldn't be a good place to start, but something like food waste. Food waste is something that students can understand. And oftentimes in the language classroom, we can scaffold what our students are saying, right? So again, it takes a bit more planning and thinking about how to do that but we can give our students structures on how to express themselves in very, very basic ways around environmental issues like food waste. And if you can set that up over a couple different classes where maybe you're teaching those structures, those models in the first couple of classes, right? Having students do lighter conversations or even express themselves on paper and then trying to get them to do small sort of communicative types of activities. So there, there is ways to do it, but I, I definitely do take your point that a lot of this stuff is going to work much, much better at higher level areas. Um, and at the lower level, it's going to take a little bit more planning and structure. So I hope, I hope that was helpful, Nora. Yeah, it was. Thank you very much, Dr. No, Nora, do you have any ideas for how to do that? Or have you come across anything that's really interesting that you want to share? The thing is, uh, mostly what I saw, it was like higher level proficiency class activities, like presentations, group discussions. But I was personally thinking of this because mostly I taught higher levels myself in university. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't have a lot of experience in teaching lower level students. And it was mostly, you know, how to introduce yourself, what to do in a bank, etc. Those kind of situations we teach the students in lower levels. Um, so what I was thinking, like, at right now in the world, the problems we are facing, it's getting bigger and bigger and students have to face those issues and they are familiar with those, maybe not in English, but whatever their mother tongue is, they are familiar with those issues. So maybe we could introduce them the terms, like basic terms, like environmental words, for example, I don't know, earthquake, uh, et cetera. Um, so I thought like there are vo vocabulary at least that could be taught to students, with, you know, with just some pictures even. Um, so at least they are familiar with those. And for example, basic linkers like because and so, giving them some structured uh, sentences so they can complete the sentences with those. Again, with lots of guidance, as you said, scaffolding. 
these were just some random ideas I came up with. I couldn't find a lot uh, actually from my readings. That's why I wanted to ask. No, 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 there's, there's not a lot out there at the moment. But anyways, maybe you can help me develop the field a bit more. <laughs> Good luck with your masters. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. There's a question in the chat. Okay. I, I can't see it, unfortunately. Oh, okay. Do you, do you want to read it out? That'd be great. Um, what are the challenges you are facing when putting your aspiration in practice, working with actual students? What are the areas you need help? Okay, so this is, I guess, me me personally. I mean, I, I'm uh, currently, I teach, um, one of the things that I've been really lucky with at Conan University is I took on a course that was called Global Challenges. And one of the, the things is it, it's, it's a sort of a CLIL kind of course. Uh, it's focused on the language skills, but it also is centered around the sustainable development goals, right? So the students are, learning about um, a sustainable development goal, one of them over two or three weeks. And there is this cycle that happens, right? So we do some scaffolding, we do some language elements. Um, and so for me, uh, I've been very, very lucky in the sense that I've had a hand in it and I've been able to shape that course um, for some of our part-time staff. Uh, so that, that, is, that would be probably one of those major challenges for me is, is how do I go about doing that with this background in language education for sustainable development. Um, another challenge for me is I want to start teaching this in um, other ways. So I teach an environmental ethics class, for example. I also teach a model United Nations class where we have students learning about um, the UN and actually going to a conference representing a country and a major challenge in the world that's connected to an SDG. And that is uh, unbelievably challenging to scaffold and to set up and then to have students you know, at, at the conference I stand back and I'm not allowed to interfere whatsoever and it is extremely challenging as a teacher to have the students set up for that and then to watch them go and it has been uh, kind of miraculous the students really even though I always worry that these are very very challenging complex difficult things for them to do, they end up doing it. They do it marvelously. So I think having that faith in that complexity, giving students that autonomy, and you can really create some really incredible things for students. So I hope that was helpful. I hope that answered the question. Feel free, uh, if there's any questions from the audience here too, feel free to just shout them out. And uh, I'd love to hear, too, if people have ideas around uh, major challenges to education. So I brought up those three challenges and some questions, but feel free to jump in as well. Okay. Uh, so, like, Joshua, if I may. Uh, Hi, Pavel. Yeah, yeah. please. Uh, one question I have about, about it, I'm not really sure. So if I would take a language course, I would be interested in learning language. That would be my, my um, main kind of target. So, yeah, uh, in, uh, uh, I don't really understand uh, this whole approach. I don't see any language learner here. Uh, is it, uh, so what would be the goal, I mean, as, as far as the language learning is concerned? Uh, would it be like a vocabulary building? Um, activity or would it be like conversation practice or what would be your language learning part or... right thank you very much for the, the question so so uh the language education usually when i'm presenting at you know, conferences like jolt right or um those are language teachers that i'm presenting to and you guys are content teachers so i focus a little bit differently but in terms of the language uh so it is it is really really challenging Okay, well, first, first, let me say one thing that our students, when you are teaching them a language, so if I want to learn, I'm learning Japanese right now, right? Anytime we learn a language, very often we set it up through, we need a context or some content to do that through, right? And in the past, typically that's been, let's do a day at the airport, right? And so you learn sets of vocabulary around an airport, you learn scaffolding about the types of questions you would use and the answers that you would typically get, right? And then you 
proceed to practice it in all sorts of different ways and contexts. And in this way, we are essentially doing the same thing, but we're giving students content that is important to them, right? Uh, and these, the sustainable development goals are really, really essential things. Once you, you know, the students, I, I still get moans and groans when I put up that slide because the students have sort of seen it so much, the sustainable development goals, they see it everywhere now. And it's become sort of this talking point. But when you really throw it in their hands, right? And give, you know, say, okay, well, what do you guys think of SDG2? And what is important for you around that SDG? The students get really excited about it. Right, And you can get them to do homework research where they go away, research something even in Japanese or a different language, bring it in. And then the challenge is how do I communicate that to the other students in English, right? And that's where you as a teacher can come in and start adding in those layers of language education, right? So SDG2 has sets of technical vocabulary words around it, right? That concept of no hunger. And so you can be there to start scaffolding and implementing those language, right? Here's how that language is used, here's the collocations, right? Here's the structures that you use in conversation and then have the students actually participate and actively use that language and then maybe write about it later and then find an area where they can present on. So those are all of those sort of language elements that we can tie in as teachers. But again, that, that's a, actually putting together like a full course. I, I see LESD as something that you can apply lightly using scope, maybe one or two elements or you can apply heavily, right? Where you redevelop an entire course to do that. And that's where you really have to think carefully about the language education from that discipline. And then also bringing in those elements of um, important content, right? And sort of inspired by the sustainable development goals. Did that kind of answer your question? So, so uh, yeah, so now I understand it is the opportunity of automotive development issues, right? You need to have a language class to read the learners issues, right? Yeah. So in this case, it could be applied to uh, the climate issue, but possibly gender related issues, diet, or I don't know, bias related. Okay. Uh, when, I, when, I listen to your, when I listen to your uh, presentation, so I actually thought that the uh, language classes would very well uh, would have a function of kind of the Bridges, uh, which would put together, uh, well, okay, let me, let me, uh, <laughs> okay. no, no but, problem. But yeah, uh, the yeah. language classes could have the function or the opportunity where the different fields could be actually discussed together. We were talking about complex fields, right? We were talking about like a, a different subject class, uh, you know, thought separately, and then those that those uh, the professional courses they they don't really talk to each other. So maybe uh, language classes could be a platform, could be a space where this uh, you know interdisciplinary uh, discussion could take place. But uh, again, so the probably the function of learning language be uh, suppressed by the basic things that I'm not sure. It, it, just, uh, so, uh, no, no, no. So it's, it's something it's it's a criticism that's come up before in that sense, but. What, one of the things is, is uh, a big, big field of language education is motivation, right? And, you know, learning about the airport again and again and again, right? Or going to a restaurant, you know, which is a common theme. If you're a language teacher, I feel the groans coming <laughs> from them. You know, it's quite boring, but, you know, uh, an interdisciplinary problem, right? So there's SDG 13, which is around climate change. And, having students talk about climate change and then breaking them up and saying, okay, well, you're gonna study, this group here is gonna do a research project about the ocean, right? And it's up to them to present about the ocean. You guys are gonna present about the chemistry around it. You guys are gonna present around the human migration that happens because of climate change, right? And suddenly students get really, really excited. They're, that's the motivation. They want to be able to express these ideas, right? Because these they see them as important, they've done the research. And so there, there is some, at least this is something that I've found in a lot of the teaching that I've done and things that I get excited about is that, that that motivation becomes very, very intrinsic and it gives them a reason to express themselves in another language, right? Instead of it just sort of being a exercise to get the mark or get the grade or, right? So that, that's sort of the idea. That's, that's really the basic element. Yeah, sure. 
Yeah, I'm going to agree with you. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, I think we still have a little bit of time. If um, if there's anybody else with some pressing questions, I'm sure everybody wants to get to their holiday as quickly as they can. Okay, so maybe uh, with that, uh, we will go ahead and wrap it up. A huge, huge thanks to all those who came in on Zoom. It's very, very much appreciated. Um, if you're interested in any of the research, today I gave you a really quick once over. I should have spent more time on LESD, I think, but my research is available in those useful links and references. Feel free to send me an email and I will be very happy to share any of that research with you if you'd like to learn a little bit more about what I'm trying to develop. Uh, and if you have ideas, I'm looking for people to help support and develop this discipline going forward. So again, huge thanks to everybody for their time, Cecilia and University of Tokyo for the support um, putting this all on together. So huge round of applause to everybody. Thank you very, very much. Did you have anything to say, Cecilia?